Good morning, everyone. Can everybody uh, hear me? Fantastic. Did you all get enough to eat over at the breakfast bar? Awesome. Whenever I'm asked to speak at uh, events like this, I, uh, my first question is, is there going to be food? <laughs> uh, most of the time, it's for logistical reasons. I'm usually running in between meetings uh, from one way to the next, and I always need nourishment. Um, I love food. I love eating it. I love cooking it. I love shopping for it, especially at wholesale retailers, like cash and carry. I show up in a cash and carry every Sunday, and I am like, yeah, you need 30 pounds of tomatoes, Sarah. You want those two racks of rib? And the cashier's like, you're feeding a family of seven? And I'm like, nope, just two. And I always like to think that food is the great equalizer. Because we're humans, uh, organic machines, and everybody needs to eat, right? Everybody needs to eat. Uh, to be equal means what? Equal means the same. Equality <laughs> means that we have the same value. Uh, we are the same uh, inherently on the insides and what we believe in and what we want as human beings. Um, I love to cook for people. Uh, I have a tendency whenever I meet somebody new, whether it be professionally or friendly, to invite them over and I always make the same thing. I always make garlic fried rice with some type of like pungent green vegetable and some dank ass ribs. <laughs> and I always watch very, very carefully at how my friend, I'm like, you better eat those ribs with your hands. You better get messy. You better eat all the meat off the goddamn bone, because if you don't, we can't be friends. <laughs> and I'm like, oh, Sarah, why do you think this about food? Why are you putting so much value on how individuals interact with the food that you make for them? And that's because I'm hella Filipino, I'm Hawaiian. Uh, we love food. In our family, food is love. Love is culture. Culture is family. It's this beautiful food triangle, love family triangle. Uh, and sometimes, though, food can be problematic. Uh, two weeks ago, my youngest cousin, uh, my youngest cousin graduated from high school. Uh, he joined Running Start, so he's like 18, and he's on his way to his AA, and the whole family's like, yeah! And my uncle was like, I'm going to roast a pig. I'm going to roast a pig, because when you're Filipino, pig is king. And rice is its queen. <laughs> so to commemorate any event, whether that be a new baby, a graduation, a new job, we roast a goddamn pig. And then my uncle asks my cousin, what else do you want for your graduation party? And my cousin goes, I want lumpia. For those of you who don't know what lumpia is, lumpia is basically a meat and vegetable stick wrapped in a wheat wrapper and deep fried. It is a stick of ambrosial goodness. <laughs> and so my cousin Nico is like, I want my grandma to make this lumpia. So my grandma goes, OK, baby, how much lumpia do you think you will need for your party? How many people will be here? And my cousin goes, well, I think like 18 to 20 people. What do you think? She goes, OK, 18, 20. I think we need 1,000 lumpia. <laughs> and he was like, cool. And she was like, you know, there may not be leftovers, but everybody will get enough to eat. And my cousin's like, awesome. Oh, hey, Grandma, uh, do you think you can make some of that thousand lumpia? Do you think you can make a couple hundred vegetarian? And she goes, what? <laughs> what is that? <laughs> and he goes, oh, you know, vegetarian, it means just like vegetables and no meat in there. She goes, you, you don't want meat in there? <laughs> Why? He goes, well, some of my friends coming to my graduation are vegetarians. She goes, are they sick? <laughs> and he goes, no, grandma, they're actually some of the healthiest people I know. She goes, well, then, OK, I can make some vegetarian kind for them. I will put only chicken in there. <laughs> And she tells me the story later, and she's just like, I don't understand why nobody would want to eat meat. And I'm like, Grandma, times are changing. People interact with food the same way that they interact uh, uh, with higher level, what I consider higher level things, whether that be uh, religion, education. That food has now become about ideology. It has become uh, closely tied to our values, rather than just eating for nourishment to walk around as organic machines. And she was like, well, when I was in the Philippines, in the poor countryside, we were lucky 
to get even this much rice and this much pork skin. And I'm like, well, of course she wouldn't understand why people wouldn't want to eat meat when that's the only thing she had access to growing up. Uh, I have a particular affinity for Top Ramen. I really like Top Ramen. Uh, <laughs> when I was five years old, my mom and I used to have this thing called Dr. Seuss Dinner Story Time. She had bought a full box set of Dr. Seuss books when I was in kindergarten, because she was like, ooh, my girl knows how to read, she's hooked on phonics, let's get some rhyming books, but also with a social activist message. And at that time, I was like, green eggs and ham, I don't know what you're talking about, ma'am. <laughs> and so every night when I was five years old, she would call me down for dinner. Sarah, baby, wash your hands. It's time for dinner. OK, mommy, I'll be down. I just have to go do it first. Do, 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 dinner time. Yeah. Hi, mom. Uh, what are we going to have for dinner tonight? Oh, we are going to have your favorite meal. Oh, yeah. What's my favorite meal? What's your favorite meal? It's going to be top ramen, top ramen. And guess what? What, mommy? I put an egg in there just for you. <gasps> you put an egg in there for me? You're the best mom ever. <laughs> All right, baby, sit down. Uh, what book do you want to read tonight? Um, can we read uh, the Sneetches? Baby, we've been reading Sneetches for the last week. Don't you want to move on to Horton Hears a Who? No, Ma, I just really like the pictures in there because they're like big fluffy ducks with the bellies and the stars. My child is a weirdo. Okay, sit down, baby. Are you ready? Eat your noodles. <clears throat> The star-bellied sneeches had bellies with stars, and the plain-bellied sneeches, oh, these noodles are hot, had none upon theirs. <laughs> hey, Mama. Yeah, baby? Why don't you ever eat dinner when we have the dinner story time? What do you mean, baby? I'm always the one eating the noodles, and you're the one reading the story. Do you not have dinner time because we're the poor people? Did you hear that? Um, well, I was on the playground the other day, and me and Michael were playing grocery store. Ding dong! Hello, grocery man. I need some apples. Ugh! What do you want? You're not supposed to say that, Michael. You're supposed to say, can I help you? No. -uh. You're supposed to say, Paper or plastic? What does that even mean? It means, are you going to pay for your groceries in money or credit card? <laughs> oh, that makes sense. Um, well, I don't have money or the credit card, but I got food stamps. You have food stamps? Yeah. I mean, they're leaves from over there, but you can pretend. Here, take them. Oh, only Poor people have the food stamps. Well, fine, I'm the poor people. Can I have my 10 mud pies, please? Thank you. Hey, Michael. Yeah? Are you poor people? <laughs> no. <laughs> what is poor people? <laughs> poor people means that you don't have enough money to buy real food. That's why you get free lunch and why your parents have food stamps, because they don't work hard enough to make money. Oh. So that's what happened yesterday on the playground, Mom. Is that why you don't eat the noodles with me? Because we're the poor people? Yeah. That's why I don't eat dinner with you, baby, because <clears throat> You see those little tomato plants we put over there by the window the other day? Yeah. And we put the little seeds in the pots? Yeah. What do we need to give these little seeds in order to grow big and strong? Photosynthesis? I mean, <laughs> uh, what, what else do we need? Um, food, that's right. 
We need to give these little tiny seeds enough food so they can grow big and strong. And you know what, baby? I'm already big and strong. And you're still growing. And that's why when we have dinner story time, you get the noodles and mommy doesn't get the noodles because I don't need them as much as you. Does that make sense? Yeah. Okay. You ready for the sneeches? Yes. The star-bellied sneeches had bellies with stars, and the plain-bellied sneeches had a nun upon bars. When uh, I was in college, I, I went to school to be a theater major, get my BFA at a primarily white, primarily liberal progressive institution. Uh, my sophomore year, we do this thing called generative ensemble in which everybody in the group writes the play and we perform it for an audience at the end of the semester. I wasn't really a playwright. I mean, I was 19. I didn't know what I was doing. Uh, and so other people, my classmates, were writing roles for me. And before we begin rehearsal, we're looking at the script and I discover that the role written for me is an old Japanese lady who owns a store uh, on the corner and the only lines that she has is just kind of hurling racial slurs at other people. And then I noticed that the only role written for my only black peer in the group was the homeless uh, junkie who hung out in front of the store. And uh, the director of that piece was like, all right, guys, we got to go through the script. We got to cut out about 40 pages. Uh, let's be some really strong editors. And I was like, I have a problem. Maybe we can like cut these scenes. And before I knew it, he had pulled me out of the classroom into the hallway. And he was like, we need to have a talk. And I was like, great, I'm ready. Let's have a talk about some serious issues. And he was like, You're being really disruptive. Your peers spent a lot of time writing that play. I didn't see any uh, offerings from you regarding scenes, regarding character development. Is it because you want a bigger part? Is that it, Sarah? Your part isn't enough for you? And I was like, mind you, I was 19. If he had said that to me now, I would be like, bitch. <laughs> But back then, I was like so mad, I didn't know what to say, so I started to cry. And at the sight of tears, he automatically became contrite. Oh my God, I'm so sorry. Oh, you know, I know how hard it is to be an Asian actor. I know how hard it is to be a woman. I'm like, really, white guy? <laughs> and he was like, here's what I can do for you. I can create some uh, connections with a couple of my Filipino friends in the acting community, and maybe they can help you figure your stuff out. And from that day on, any time I walked into that institution, it was as if my creative spirit was being crushed constantly. Um, and I didn't know what to do. It was as if I was going to my Shakespeare class, and even though I was learning how to scan, my teachers were telling me that I would never be Juliet. It was as if I was going to my networking class, and my teachers were like, you need to schmooze with everybody, but especially the brown people. It was as if I was going to my physical technique class, uh, learning how to learn choreography, and people were like, yeah, you're not really going to be in the background of musicals because you're a little bit short, and you can only really do King and I. And so I had this little bit of a crisis. I was like, my creative spirit is being challenged every day. Who am I? What am I doing? There's only really one thing that I can say with assertion about humanity. I think that there's a lot of people who like to throw out themes of universality. People like to throw out platitudes. And I have a really big problem with that. Only because we're not the same. Thanks to systemic systems uh, of oppression, we're not equal. <coughs> And I actually think it's our differences when placed side by side that tell us more about our collective human experience than to put a general wash and say that we're the same. Because we know that that's not, right? I'm sure some of you walked in today and looked at that breakfast bar and thought, I wonder if I can eat this today. If you have a gluten sensitivity. I wonder if you came in here and had a complicated relationship with the pastry you saw on the table that reminded you of something that happened to you in your childhood. I wonder if you came in today 
and you just have a complicated relationship with food. So we're not the same. Food is not the great equalizer, Sarah. <laughs> and I think about what it means to be creative. And for me, creativity means challenging what we think, how we think, and what we do. I don't think that we walk around in a vacuum. We interact with each other day to day. So how we think, what we think, what we do, not only affects us, but affects every single person that we come into contact with in exponential waves. And when we talk about something like equality, what are we really talking about? For me, as an artist, equality means giving space and making space for those who have stories, who every day are told that their stories cannot exist alongside these stories. The little excerpt that you just saw uh, that I performed my Dr. Seuss dinner storytelling time, uh, that's a part of my show Dragon Lady. Dragon Lady started in college as a result to this institutional oppression that was crushing my creative spirit. I felt as if who I was as a person could not stand next to another person. I felt that I was walking around every single day and I had the TV, I had magazines, I had my professors, I had history telling me that my experience and my perspective and my values didn't matter. And I thought, then what the hell am I here for? Why am I walking around in the world if none of this matters? What can I do to fuel my creative spirit? And then I realized, I can use my creativity to carve a space out for me. And because I don't walk alone in the world, I can use my creativity to carve out that space bigger for other people. So that bringing people into that space will continue carving, continue making more space for others to come in. And so now whenever I invite people over for ribs, I make sure that I have a vegetarian option. I make sure that I use gluten-free soy sauce. I make sure to mentally prepare myself that if they don't want to eat, it doesn't mean that they can't be my friend. And I try to, every day, remind myself that what I think, how I think, and what I do is not just about me. And I use my creativity as the vehicle to share that with people. Thank you so much. Great, I will leave now. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no question. I've got like a way back. All right. <clears throat> All right. <laughs> Me too. All right. All right, did this end? All right, so can you tell us about um, who have been some of the role models for you? Like, you talked a lot about equality almost in the same uh, way is hospitality, like creating those places for people to belong. Who are the people who taught you what that looked like? My parents, <clears throat> uh, for sure. Uh, my mother's my biological mother. Uh, she's a lesbian. So my other mom, Tina, uh, is a black woman, a disabled black woman. Um, and quite honestly, it was those two women uh, who instilled in me the idea that Everything we do affects other people, so why would we spend so much time thinking only about ourselves? Does that answer your question? Yeah. <laughs> Love some moms. Awesome. <laughs> Great. Um, I was going to say, we have a big 
community here, so I'm curious if there's any asks that you want to ask of this awesome, friendly community. Say that one more time. So we have a big community here, mm -hmm. so is there an ask that you would ask of us as part of this big, friendly community? Right, right, yes. Ah. So my understanding is that everybody who is here is some type of creative entrepreneur. Am I wrong? I'm right. Yes. <clears throat> so my ask of you is how are you going to use your creative entrepreneurship to create space for other people? How can you use your position as an individual, the leverage that you have in your specific community, your institution, your organizations, to create space for other people who would not normally be there? That would be my ask. Thank you. What advice would you give young people of color who want to enter the theater and creative professions? Uh, How should they train? Say that one more time. What should they do? How should they train for your work? Wonderful. Um, the first thing that I would tell them, especially for young people of color, there's a lot to unpack when you're a minority. When I say unpack, what I, what I mean specifically is that there's a lot of internalized ideas about who you are because of what society has been telling you since the day you were born. And sometimes what that looks like, often what I found specifically working with young people, is that they think that their stories aren't enough and they start to apologize for what they have to say. So my first and foremost advice to them is don't apologize. Take up as much space as you want. Forgive yourself for feeling like you're not enough because it's not your fault. Like, it's partially your responsibility to unpack that, but it's the result of hundreds of years of oppression, right? Uh, an immediate environment. That would be my first thing. And that first step is huge. Anybody can get training, yeah? Um, or rather, I should say that training is a set of technical skills that with money and time and space, people can have access to. What you do with that training and how that training intersects with your identity, your personal mission and beliefs, it's very different. I don't think that training is any guarantee that somebody's a good person. I know that for a fact. And I think that the same goes for artists. Just because you have training doesn't mean that you're a good socially responsible artist. So I'd focus more on that first step and then help them find the specific training that they want to better suit their objective. Does that answer your question? Awesome. I'm not sure. Just yell. Just yell. Okay. Um, so going going back to that class you had in that institution when you were 19 years old, if now you were to go back and have the opportunity, and the teacher said, "I want to do this right," what advice would you give to a largely white institution? taught by perhaps a white male person, how can I do this right with this class? Uh, the first thing I would say is hire me. <laughs> hire me. And then from there, to speak first generally, that type of transformation when it comes to an institution has to come from the top and the bottom together. So what does that look like? It needs to start in the board, make its way down to admin, make its way into education, professors, and then programming. And then there needs to be active work down here to bring in the people who will be benefiting or interacting with this programming specifically. And then along the journey, there needs to be constant accountability. Uh, I often think that when it comes to equity and equality, uh, EDI training, equity, diversity, and inclusion, that for me, in my mind, people have a tendency to jump to step three. Uh, I'll use theater as an example. Uh, the problem is, we don't have colored people on stage. So a white institution goes, awesome. We're going to have the one black show a year, and then the one Asian show, and then only call in colored actors for those roles. Or they go, we're going to have a show that is not traditionally cast with people of color, but just kind of put people of color in there, but not talk about what it means to be a person of color in a Jane Austen play. That's step three. Step one 
is <laughs> an investigation, uh, an, a rigorous investigation of systemic structure, looking at the institution from within. Um, we could talk about this all day, definitely. <laughs> I hope I answered part of your question. Oh, and I can say uh, with my work with Intamon Theater as their co-curator, it's a radical leadership model in which I basically get to be a co-artistic director for a year. Um, this institution decided that if they were going to be an arts activist institution and promote racial equity and diversity on stage and off stage, they had to hire people. And they had to put those people in positions of power. They had ultimately, they needed to seed power and give it to someone who knew what to do with it. And that's me this year. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, so you talk a lot about food and how important it is to identity. Um, do you think it's possible for someone to, say, replicate Filipino cuisine but not be a, a Filipino person? Yes. I think that it is possible. Uh, like I said before, I don't think that any individual walks in a vacuum. Uh, which means that context is so important. <laughs> What's the context is what I want to know. Uh, of course, anytime I hear that happening, my first impulse is like, there is, they are columbusing our cultural cuisine <laughs> and charging $15 for adobo when I can make it for them in my house. <laughs> and then I have to ask myself, okay, so what's the difference between cultural appropriation and appreciation? So I can say confidently to your question that yes, it's possible, but depending on the context, it's a, it depends on, depending on the context, that affects if it's problematic or not. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Um, so I think that what your um, excerpt from your play illustrated was that there's a kind of practice and socialization in terms of being able to be comfortable talking about, like, say, class or talking about race. And I think that people of color, queer people, women, are used to talking about those issues because it's their lives. It's our lives. Um, for people with privilege or people in positions of power, how can they practice that muscle of being able to talk about race without having women, people of color, queer people, like, hold their hand along the way? Yeah, that's a great question. Uh, <clears throat> yes, so the question, do you mind if I repeat, Ryan? Uh, the question is, how can white people or white allies talk about race without women of color and other minority groups holding their hand? So how can they stand alone as allies? Wonderful. <sighs> There's a wealth of information available online, uh, even here in Seattle, regarding racial equity and diversity training. Um, so this goes back to an earlier question in terms of access to programming uh, and information, right? We talked about this earlier in terms of technical skills and how to be an actor. Great. You have this over here. Uh, you can get, uh, you have access to vocabulary around racial identity, uh, a white ally has access to that. They also have access to information about how they, as a white politicized body, are complicit in structures of oppression. Great, here's this training over here. What's happening over here with the individual? I wish I had a more specific answer for you, Ryan, but whenever I've had allies come to me and ask them what to do, I ask them, what are you doing? Why are you doing? Why, why, why? And what I found is that most of my white allies don't know why they're doing what they're doing. Uh, not only in terms of racial equity diversity training, but just kind of like period, like what their belief system is. Because you can have all this training over here, but if the individual is not aligned with this intersection and what happens at this intersection, which is action and policy, will never happen. So. I think it's a combination of like, go out there, find the information for yourself. Don't rely on people of color, trans people, poor people to help you. And then do some intense individual solo work here. 
I hope that answers your question. Thank you. <laughs> Just yell. Oh, great. Okay. <laughs> Just yelling. <laughs> I can so, say I'm a free agent. I can walk around. <laughs> yeah, but they can't hear. Yeah, no, I'll walk around over that way so I can be in the camera. <laughs> okay. <laughs> you want to yell the question back after I say it? I totally can. Okay. Um, if I, I love creative mornings and the energy here. But if we were a microcosm of the city that we're in, I would be the oldest person in Seattle looking around, no. oh, and okay. one of the brownest. <laughs> and there's something wrong there. And everybody in Seattle would be like a whole lot younger and better looking than me. So something's clearly wrong with our subset, our ability to sample the greater community and bring in people who don't look like us. Um, we were challenged a few months ago, do something about that, and I think we're trying, but I'm looking around and it's like, it's not working yet. How do we get a more diverse sampling of creative people? Because I'm sure there are creative people who do not look like us. We're obviously the privileged ones. We're able to get time off work on a work day to come in and have breakfast with fantastic, inspiring people. But what are we missing that we haven't reached out to or haven't been able to figure out how to bring in? I guess that's about as much of my question as I can get without rambling. Great, and, do you, and I'm, gonna, I'm just gonna repeat what I think I'm hearing in terms of your question, is how can we, even in this room, get a larger, diverse sampling of the creative entrepreneurs here in our city? Is that a correct? Thank you. And entrepreneur is <clears throat> loose because a lot of us work for agencies. Mm -hmm. or I, God forgive me, work for government. <clears throat> Sorry, everybody. <laughs> <laughs> we aren't all at startups or owning our own. So it's mm -hmm. entrepreneur as in I think we're all self-starting. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. We all get, we all make stuff happen wherever we happen to be. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Uh, great question. I going to try and answer that question and then I'm also going to posit something for you all to think about. Uh, a lot of the work that I do uh, in EDI training is how can we make this more diverse? What can we do? And the first thing that I want everyone to know is that it takes time. Even in the larger scheme of the world, like humans have been around like, so if the earth was a clock and they were like, how long have humans been around? We've been around for a millisecond before midnight. Um, if we, even if we look at America, <laughs> we're still the new country. And in terms of how can we do the work so that we can see it, as in point to it and say that it's tangible in our lifetime, uh, I'm not sure, or rather, thinking about that oftentimes for me stifles me in my process of getting people into the room. Because a lot of what we do, we won't see the fruition of because of systemic issues. What we can do is lay the groundwork for the people to come after us to keep doing the work. And that moving in that direction is always better than staying still. Uh, and in terms of how we can get people in here, uh, technically, that's a great question. And I'd be interested in coming up with a marketing strategy uh, and a panel of people who do specific community engagement so that we can diversify what Creative Mornings is and the people in this room. I hope that answers your question a little. <laughs> awesome, awesome. Thank you. It's a big question. Do you have any poets uh, or other writers, playwrights that you enjoy and would recommend? Uh, do you mean just specifically you happen to like to on topic or outside the topic, either way? Yeah, there's actually a female comedian that I've been following pretty closely uh, named Ali Wong. <laughs> uh, if you don't know her, she was, she, was kind of she was kind of pushed into the mainstream as a comedian when she uh, filmed her set at the Neptune actually, and it's actually on Netflix, it's called Baby Cobra. Uh, she's a writer for TV, has been for a very, very long time. Uh, 
I love her because as an Asian woman, everything she does takes up space. Uh, she doesn't apologize for who she is, and she actually takes stereotypes that we project onto Asian women, flips them, destroys them, and eats them for breakfast. I love Ali Wong. Um, I mean, I've read everything that Barack Obama has written. Um, and in terms of playwrights, I like a lot of new playwrights whose work isn't necessarily available online uh, or published yet. Uh, but I would encourage you, Seattle is quickly becoming an enclave for new work. Uh, for those of you who aren't um, in theater, new work is really, really scary for people. Uh, institutions don't want to invest in new work because it's a risk. And for nonprofit models, you cut out the risk as much as you can. Uh, but I would uh, encourage you, <laughs> funnily enough, the most comprehensive calendar for theater events in the city is actually Teen Ticks. If you guys go to Teen Ticks and look up their events and look at the smaller fringe companies, you have Annex Theater, you have Forward Flux. Uh, these are places that are doing new work. And in terms of playwrights, for me, I'm too busy writing plays to read much of other playwrights' work, and that's something that I'm working on. I hope that answers your question. Awesome. Hi. I actually just relocated here from Madison, Wisconsin. Um, and actually, you know, listening to the conversation this morning and being here just about a week, it's refreshing to know that uh, Seattle does not have this figured out either. Um, <laughs> it's, it's actually very refreshing. Uh, we share similar experiences. I would love to talk with, is your name? Al. Al. I'd love to talk with you more because this is happening. I went to the University of Minnesota, Twin Cities. Same thing happened in, in that community, the artistic community. The question I have, you know, I've been listening, and it's a very simple question. Can I come over for dinner and eat some of those ribs? That you <laughs> yes. Make you some of those ribs. <laughs> yes. Ribs as a vehicle for social change. <laughs> Awesome, thank you. Anybody? About 10, minutes. Anybody else? 10 minutes, longest of my life. Wow. Kidding. <laughs> All right, you said you're, hi, you said you're working on plays. What is your creative process? Oh, yes. <laughs> my creative process is eating ribs by myself late at night in my laptop. No. Uh, <laughs> Uh, I do a lot of solo work, again, because it's really my way of taking up space. Uh, there are a lot of roles out there that like, I don't want to play, so I write the roles that I want to play. Um, how it, for those of you uh, who don't work in theater, just kind of traditionally how a play gets workshopped is the playwright spends a lot of time by themselves, then they reach out to a director. The director reads it, goes, yeah, that's okay, let's see what happens. They bring in actors to read it around a table, and then sometimes an audience is invited to get feedback, so then the playwright can go back home and make those changes. I don't do that. <laughs> I have a tendency to write, and then to be like, can I perform this at your theater for these nights? And everybody's like, yeah, you're Sarah Porkalab, you have an opinion, sure. And then I perform it, and that's my workshopping. Uh, I can say with confidence that about 15% of my shows are improv on the night, depending on my audience because my audience is my scene partner, and again, I don't walk alone in the world, I'm not alone in that theater, even though I'm a solo performer. So interacting with somebody actually tells me more about what I've written as a piece that communicates to people rather than a thing that I keep separate. So my creative process is really like, share, <laughs> share some more. Ugh. Oh, it's getting better. Uh, but it takes, it's, it's really, it's the doing of the thing. Does that make sense? It's the sharing with people that really uh, have the biggest impact on my creative process. I hope that answers your question. Okay, yeah, sure. <laughs> we got time for one or two more. Anybody else? Hi. Uh, okay. There you go. Um, What's your experience with imposter syndrome and what are your thoughts on how to overcome it? <coughs> Can you hear that? One more time. 
Um, your thoughts on imposter syndrome, your experience with it, and any advice? Oh, yeah. Uh, I don't think it'll ever leave me. Um, I guess for, for people here, uh, imposter syndrome, what, what does that mean? Uh, what does it look like? What does it feel like? Uh, everybody in, in here knows what an imposter is, right? Somebody in a space that doesn't belong there. Imposter syn in syndrome is an internalized way of feeling about yourself in a space. As a woman, as a person who's brown and who grew up poor, I still have a really hard time calming my energy whenever I walk into a boutique in downtown Seattle where a shirt is $500. I have a really hard time calming my energy when I walk into the lobby of an expensive hotel. And whenever I feel this like, ooh, I'm not supposed to be here, I take a minute to find a quiet corner and I remind myself that the only, way I, the only reason I feel that way is because of outside forces, not because that's who I am, but because for 28 years of my life, everywhere I've turned, I've told people, people I've been exposed to things that tell me that I don't belong there. So it's really taking a moment with myself. Uh, I don't know if you guys have heard about this, this thing, but it's like the seven seconds of uncomfortability, the idea that whenever we're in a situation, we just have to literally give ourselves at least seven seconds to be uncomfortable and to be in that like, ah, and then after the seven seconds, we can be like, I'm cool, I'm chill. So in terms of imposter syndrome, uh, I just have to keep tabs on it. I have to keep tabs, and whenever it starts to rear its ugly, ugly head, I gotta go into a corner and be like, shut up, <laughs> sit down, at least for the next two hours, because I gotta go do some work. Woo, and I'm easy. Uh, but it really is going back to who am I, what am I doing, what is my worth? I hope that helps. Awesome. Great questions. Oh my God. <laughs> awesome. Hi. So you had mentioned that um, in your program when you were going in and you felt like you were creatively being crushed every single day, how did you move beyond that? How did you overcome that? Like any specific practices or anything that helped you? Yeah. Uh, you know, for, oh, repeat the question? Great. So. I had mentioned earlier when I was at my college institution, I felt that my creative spirit was getting crushed every day. So the question was, how did I overcome that? How did I work my way through that? Um, fear is a scary thing. Like fear itself, you're like, oh, I'm scared. And if you were to take a second out of your body, you're like, look at me being scared, that's scary. And that's what a lot of uh, my time in college felt like because the thing that gave me motivation, the thing that told me this is why you're here was being like smacked and punched and crushed. And it was scary because it felt as if any second I could disappear. So what did I do to keep myself from disappearing? I had to be okay with that fear. <sighs> Breathe through it for seven seconds, or four years really, it was four years breathing through it. Uh, <laughs> and then whenever I was confronted with something that added like fire to that, I had to take a deep breath and shut that shit down. And it was scary because I felt like I was alone for a lot of the time. And then I allowed myself to be vulnerable with a professor. And this professor and what she, oh, I'm getting emotional, what she had to say to me was honestly the one lifeline that I had all throughout college. And in terms of how do you overcome the thing that is crushing you, sometimes you have to stand still and take a brief, deep breath, and other times you have to reach a hand out and ask for help. I hope that answers your question. <laughs> uh, it's not even noon. <laughs> so cathartic. <laughs> Is that it? Yeah, yeah. Ah! Awesome. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.